now let me introduce to the other speaker because all of us are familiar with each other but some of the speakers are not familiar so no, let me give no. the introduction of our chairperson professor cm pandey he is biostatistician and public health expert uh, at present he is working with uh, uh, as a director uh, academic and research with super speciality hospital cardiac institute at lucknow before that he was professor and head department of biostatistics and health informatics sanjay gandhi medical institute lucknow he is expert in stochastic models uh, and survival and this thing clinical epidemiology medical demography i have always seen him with medical doctors so less with demographers <laughs> okay and he had worked lot in health system his lot of work is there in on health health issues clinical trial and uh, data management information on health system so he is expert to chair this session because uh, he will be the best person to talk about and discuss about the mathematical models or estimation and projection and our discussant is uh, uday shankar mishra is my what i should say very close friend we have done courses here together but apart from that he is a good demographer economist economic nowadays he is working more on economic issues uh, along with this uh, demography he is currently at professor at the center for development studies trivandra and he is good in evaluation programs evaluation of programs policies analytical and measurement issues in gender and health. now i request uh, professor pandey and uh, dr shankar mishra ji to take this session forward and in between if he will join i am contacting uh, uh, this our mudit jain so he will join otherwise you can follow the available person sequence whenever he will join we will include otherwise we have kept him in as a second speaker but we can have him afterwards also with this now i request uh, one question yeah. Yes, I, oh, how do we share our presentation because they share yeah, uh, yeah, yeah our it person will uh, make you this thing he will give the uh, idea okay. about how to share this thing whenever your turn will come he will open it up and you can share that and sure. we have kept this as 90 minutes session but it, it is in the evening after this there is no session if somebody want to take a little more time <laughs> we are relaxed about that. so don't worry because we uh, our open, system is open, open and ended. now we can continue but it depends upon professor pandey how he wa want to manage this session professor pandey oh, okay uh, thank you dr sayed and uh, it's my pleasure to be with all of you this evening and uh, louder uh, please little louder uh, yeah thank you dr sayed am i able to all of you now audible yes sir yes sir yeah thank you dr shahid for introducing me and at the outset i would like to congratulate iips community particularly dr james and dr saidun nisa for organizing this wonderful international seminar where you have uh, invited such a, a learned speakers on a particular session which is for modeling the epidemic modeling and it's my pleasure to chair this session and uh, my colleague for conducting this session dr uday shankar mishra is also here and uh, with a brief note because we have a limited time and we would like to listen to these experts those who are waiting for this uh, at the illustrious talk we would like to invite the first speaker uh, professor arni sridivas one of our good friends and he has been a very uh, pioneer worker in uh, epidemic modeling i know about his work on uh, flu modeling which was very popular and was used by government for forecasting and they give a very wonderful result and i remember those days and before coming to formally on this dais we were discussing about his work and now i think i'll be able to listen to some wonderful things on covid modeling also from arun 
to just to, I think Arni doesn't require any introduction, but he's currently working at uh, uh, mathematical and uh, uh, in the laboratory of theory and mathematics at Medical College Georgia, United States. And he's a, uh, I think, uh, excellent uh, researcher in the area of epidemic modeling. So with brief note, I invite Professor Arni Srinivas to present his uh, uh, lecture. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Pandey. It is really an honor for me uh, to present in the session that you are chairing. And uh, thank you for a very nice introduction. And I want to thank all the organizers, Professor Unisa, Professor James, and uh, all the entire uh, IAPS team involved in this uh, uh, event. So I would like to share my uh, screen in a minute. Before that, I want to explain that you know the, this particular work, uh, the session on the um, estimation and the projection, I chose to speak on uh, uh, the artificial intelligence model, AI model that uh, I developed about a year back, more than a year ago. Usually, as Professor Pandey mentioned, you know, every time an epidemic comes, you know, I usually I build mathematical models and then test those models in the population. Now, with the, the coronavirus started in sometime in January 2020, when I was at that time traveling, I was returning from India, and I did not uh, see any problem there, any no, no news on that. But when I arrived in the U.S., also the situation is same. You know, people are thinking it is confined only to China. It doesn't. It, it would not come to the so far as the U.S. So at that time, I thought of you know instead of developing a mathematical model, I thought of developing a uh, identification model because there are a lot of confusion on the definition of coronavirus. So at that time, this particular work has started. Uh, the the work I'm going to present today. And when I uh, when I went to initially to look at the data, CDC, they don't have a, no one has any data, and only people have the guidelines on how to identify. Hence, I developed an AI model, artificial intelligence model, I mean, mathematical model, and then behind the background, AI setup, AI framework is added there. And then with that AI setup, the front end, the data will be collected through the mobile apps. So then immediately, you know, within a few weeks, uh, I, I'm able to publish that. Uh, then that attracted worldwide media, including all the regional languages in the world, various languages. And then that actually helped uh, us to collect a lot of data, that particular work. And later I was uh, very happy to know from various researchers in the government, other people that, you know, that that is what this particular work has inspired for Aarugya Setu in India. And various Indian uh, national media also covered this particular work. So I chose to, uh, I, I'm going to present that idea of this particular work. Let me share my screen. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Arni, I think we should have 25 minutes for each speaker. Okay. So let us, uh, let us. Yeah. Do, I, do, I, Dr. Dr. Shahid Nisha has given us open-ended time, but I think 25 minutes will be okay for each speaker. Okay. I prepared for 15 minutes because that was told to me. Okay. 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 No problem. No problem. That's great. That's great. Okay. okay. Yeah. Just a minute. Can you all able to uh, see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so good evening to all. Just a minute. I don't know. It's not more rotating. Yeah. Good evening to all. This particular work, as I mentioned, I have given an introduction on that. So my the, the slides would be organized as follows. I have about uh, 10 to 12 slides. I prepared for 15 minutes talk, um, as it was uh, mentioned by the, uh, the organizers. So initially, I will speak about 
how this COVID model, how the AI model works, that is developed in this uh, particular um, this thing. And then I will explain the identification problem of the COVID. I mean, uh, identification strategy. I mean, the mathematically how the identification is done through the uh, AI approach. That I will. I'm going to explain that. So if you see that the you know the as I mentioned as I was mentioning in the uh, in the introduction of my uh, talk during the month of January as I have been 2020 about a year back more than a year ago I was working on the looking for the data you know trying to understand the 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 basic reproductive rate of the coronavirus but we don't have any data then the CDC and other agencies clearly mentioned that you know i mean the, the us government back here also you know the we heard that you know it won't cross the uh, continent it would not come to even if come to the us also everything can be controlled so that you know we were not sure what to do with it because there is no data and i never would like to work on a purely just a sake of uh, developing a model i don't want to work i, I, mean, I never enjoy working with uh, just without any data or without any uh, there are you no know, hypothetical situation hence we developed this particular model ai model for identification, who are the best one? We wanted to send that identification model to China. And then the I once the model developed, I consulted my clinical colleague and then uh, whether he can comment on the, the clinical part of the uh, draft. And then my colleague, Joe Vasquez, he's an infectious disease uh, professor. Um, we both collaborated on that. And then the, using the CDC and the WHO guidelines, we published this article that came in the journal called uh, Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology, which is the official journal of the Infectious Disease Society of America. It's a very uh, well-respected journal. And then that's the title of the article, Identification of COVID-19 can be quicker through artificial intelligence framework using mobile phone-based uh, survey when cities and towns are in quarantine. So this was much before the quarantining was introduced in Europe or US or India, other other places, other, except the China and Korea. This is that time of the in that time period, and then uh, it published in uh, February 2020. And the complete details are there. I'm going to explain the uh, the brief idea of the model. So how this model works? So in the first phase, the model collects the data model collects the data from the uh, the travel history of the patients and then the the common uh, travel history of the you know the travelers need not be patients all of them and uh, from the signs and symptoms using the mobile phone based survey and then the uh, the thousands of data points you know the whatever the user users enter the data into the into the mobile phones that would be and that would be uh, analyzed by the back end model, back end at the computer, back end at the hospital. That would be analyzed with the, um, the other, and with the AI framework, with all the risks of developing a coronavirus. And if it is developing a coronavirus, then the, if the, the chance of developing a coronavirus, uh, or you know, the having already having coronavirus, then that individual would be either you know transferred to the nearest hospital, or that individual would be. Um, uh, you know, with the mobile phone, um, mobile vans would be reaching the individual's location so that the individual can be able to, I mean, uh, we'll be able to uh, give a blood, I mean, sample for the coronavirus identification. This is a two phase. So, this is a two phase model. And then, the uh, uh, pictorially, if you see that, the suppose this is a geographical region. In a region, we have the, um, you know, we have a um, Geographical region, suppose you know, hypothetical region located like that. Situation, I mean, uh, design. I mean, um, uh, the area look, look like looks like that. And then the uh, suppose these are the houses, you know, houses in the region, and these are individuals within a house. And the individuals within a house are known. And then once the individuals of houses are known, they are I mean, responded. And uh, these are the the blue indicate the blue graph is a indicate. You know that one indicates that you know. They are all respondents, and yellow ones, yellow circles or yellow dots indicate that those individuals who have not responded to the survey. So blue ones are who have responded to the survey, and the yellow ones who have not responded to the survey. And among the respondents, those individuals who have responded to the survey, some of them would have already infected with the virus, 
and some of the non responded also might have virus in them so these are the total description of the and pictorially the all the respondents so initially we pick a geographical region some region and then that particular region we have households and those households you know some of them respond so everyone will send to the uh, everyone will be sent this you know the uh, inform everyone sent to the mobile app to uh, download and uh, fill the information and then that information is processed at the back end so some of the individuals who are not responded could not be predicted could not be predicted for their status this is the oral idea of the model this two phase model this is what uh, about a year back you know this published and then later you know this particular idea has been uh, used by various hospitals uh, the various government agencies consulted me government you know the um, uh, government's uh, uh, think tank computing uh, groups have con contact uh, government means government of india other other places of the world various other countries also i consulted based on this particular work how it can be practically implemented and then the uh, then you know the practice because those days you know the ai you know even still today ai is a very elementary stage artificial intelligence and this particular idea actually clicked very well with the industry also and then uh, through this uh, particular idea particular concept uh, in that same article uh, the theorem also been proved stated and proved that is suppose there are n individuals in the region because we need to say that you know what fraction of the individuals actually can be identified and so we need to have a solid theory behind the, all the um, all the models being developed in this uh, through for the identification suppose n individuals are there in the region that region we just saw suppose we have n individuals are there and then the the probability that you know small n1 cases are identified out of the capital n through the ai framework given that there are small n number of res responders in the survey is n1 multiplied by n by n square this is a statement statement of the theorem i'm not going complete proof of the theorem i'm just give you the next few the next couple of slides uh, idea of the theorem only not the complete proof so that means n individuals are there n individuals are there and then that in these these individuals are based on the those who are responded those who are not responded and small n n1 number of cases are identified sorry n1 number of cases are identified through the ai framework given that there are small n number of respondents are there in the survey and that probability is n1 multiplied by n by n square because we need to know whenever we develop a ai model or any such any situation because we, not only this one various other situation various other practically useful situations also currently i'm developing the ai uh related uh, models which are some of them are you know the uh, used in india other places also other in the us many other uh, situations so the idea of the proof coming to this particular proof these n n and suppose the total capital n is divided into small n small m those who are responded to the survey that i mentioned in the beginning those who are not responded to the survey that i mentioned in the beginning that is uh, the uh the what's called blue dot and the yellow dots so n and m are divided they are individuals in a particular region those who are responded and not responded for that mobile based app or online mobile based online system and the here uh, capital n equal to small n plus small m and then let u be another set where u equal to u1 u2 un be the set of individuals responded to the survey that means we divided all the individual responded each individuals need to be identified and once the individual identified that individual will be uh, sent a barcode or some identification information for that individual so that the individual when comes to the hospital that individual would be showing that uh, information like that whatever the barcode or like some security number is given because one individual responding another individual coming to the hospital that situation should not arise so we need to have a identity check that's why all the individuals suppose you be the set of individuals who are responded to the survey and then we be the individuals who are not respond to the survey those individuals so that means the total n is marked all the individuals are marked in the population so once the marking is done then the suppose u1 equal to another subset of u which are who have responded and identified possible identified cases so these are the individuals who are possibly identified to have coronavirus 
So these individuals will be either through the mobile vans, they will be tested or these individuals will be taken into the hospital or given a proper address where to go, what to do exactly, exact information will be given to these individuals for further identification. Because at the time, you know, this is, this was, this is a story around 2020 February that a lot of confusion in the society, a lot of confusion among the governments, what to do, whether it will be a problem, whether the airlines to be, uh, airlines industry should be, um, I mean, airlines, the, the moment of a, the aircrafts can be controlled or quarantined. So uh, I had also opportunity to talk to the various airlines industries. I mean, they consulted uh, me how to implement for the, you know, the, through the heat, heat map systems, various other systems, how to, how to identify the COVID individuals in the airports. So then the, these are the individuals collected and responded. And the two key events that are needed for this particular, uh, uh, this particular mathematical framework. So that means E1 and E, I call two events using the three sets. So, so far we saw three sets. One is U, another is V, another is U1. So using three sets, we defined two events, E1 and E. E1 is an N1 out of N responded. First event is that so many out of so many cases are responded and identified through the AI model. And then only so many are responded. So first of all, response need to be there. Once they responded, identification will be there. So these are the two events are important through this framework, response and identification. Then the once the response identification done, that uh, the probability, the condition probability, because the two events are there, probability E1 given E. The probability condition even that means the identifier response has to be there if the no response because of the quarantine you know that during the quarantine they are not supposed to come out of the home or under lockdown so they have to respond respond and identification and then the, that's the idea of the proof and so that way you get the n1 multiplied by n by n square and the complete proof or uh, details can be seen in the article i mentioned in the journal so these are these are the first article and a, a few weeks before that, you know, I published another article on the, um, on the, you know, the, that was not in using any data on the graphical network, how the graphical network can be done that I'm not present because this is purely on AI uh, model. Then the, the uh, as I mentioned, in almost 200 media outlets all over the world, including the regional languages in India, Spanish, Spain, Mexico, I mean, all the uh, Chinese and Japanese, maybe it is other than non-English speaking languages, English and non-English also, they covered this work. So I choose, uh, for example, the fast company, fast company, which reviews the new technologies in the world. They give a nice review in their uh, magazine and the March uh, 9th, about a year back uh, in their uh, listing, they say that uh, scientists are working on the app. So globally, this is the first AI model, first uh, app based AI model for the identification of the coronavirus in the population. And then the campus technology also another um, another uh, magazine which uh, covers only the discoveries among the uh, universities worldwide. So they also wrote a nice uh, um, article in their magazine it, within a few few days after we, as soon as the online release of the journal. Then Times of India also, they gave a nice, uh, this thing that they are saying that Indian origin scientists uh, uh, developed a first AI based model uh, in the month of uh, beginning of March, they gave a nice, uh, this thing. So this all helped me to reach, get the more data. Uh, and then immediately the Jaguar, another magazine in the regionally in the, here in the US, and then the Innovator, I mean, I'm showing only a sample of uh, magazines, and then the Innovators Magazine, Innovator Technology, Abutex Coronavirus. So these all worldwide, uh, and in India also had opportunity to present at various universities, uh, uh, the stock and uh, other modeling work. And uh, the Economic Times also later wrote a detailed uh, news coverage on that and the Hindu business news line and the various other, you know, the under reporting. After once we have that, this data, then I was asked to do the art. Uh, I was asked to do the modeling on under reporting that I'm not presenting here because today, as I mentioned, I prepared only for 15 minutes talk. Uh, so the, these are the, the other things can be the readers or the audience can look at the other data, other articles uh, the, on the modeling. For example, the modeling, the Indian context, how many cases have been reported so far? So that we publish in the country's India's topmost um, uh, scientific journal called Current Science, and which is well respected all over the world. That we publish on the Indian uh, aspect. That also 
in the month of March, we published 2020, last year around March, April, we published that article describing the model based, uh, the model based, you know, the how in just before, just around the lockdown period, you know, during the lockdown period, how many cases have been identified in India? And then the worldwide also among name, major nine countries, uh, we have done the um, study on um, eight countries. And that actually I thought of presenting that, but then they, I chose to present the AI model on the, so that's a mathematical modeling work on under reporting in the nine countries, including US, uh, including the India and US, where the Indian part I published in current science and separately. Then the, the theoretical work, theoretical framework for all the entire thing came in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, same in June 2020. And then the, very recently, just a couple of months back, because uh, if you see that none of the models all over the world have accurately predicted the uh, the, the future, uh, uh, I mean, the uh, accurately predicted the future events, uh, at least in a month notice, and uh, none of the model could able to predict the R0, the basic reproductive rate, Hence, I led a recently an article uh, that came as a you know the letter, research letter, I mean technical letter, into the in the journal that the that where it argued that how the traditional models failed, how the traditional models for that also students can look into the uh, detailed and see that you know how the what are the modifications needed the with the current setup current uh, structure of the mathematical models it is not possible it was never able to predict properly for especially coronavirus. And then the how that modification, what are the modifications can be done, that also came up very recently. And then the very last article, you know, Journal of Math Mathematical Analysis and Applications, which is a very uh, renowned Elsevier journal, that where they, we discuss the ground reality of the, in practice, the what happens on the ground uh, reality in the data collection, and practically what the model does. So these uh, discrepancy between that we discussed in the, the latest article. And uh, all can be, you know, downloaded from the, you know, I, I'll be happy to be reached there, uh, reach to any one of these, and then the, uh, to the panel members or the audience, I'll be happy. And the summary article also came in Springer, you know, intensive collaborative framework, how this, you know, uh, how this can be done, how practically the mathematical models took, or how practically the mathematical model we developed were helpful. As I mentioned, you know, I had opportunity, really thankful to all the agencies and the airlines industries. I uh, they consulted various how various ways to control the um, because the travel industry have to start because forever they cannot be you know closed travel industry has to start how mathematical models or AI based models can help the travel industry that also I have been lucky to work with them and then the various other, of course the government agencies so how this one the Springer asked us to write a summary of how this can be collaborations can be done how practically useful things can be done that's the last article they mentioned this one intensive collaborations. So I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ernie, for this nice presentation. Uh, I think it was really a very eye-opening work and which was a lot of application and it was very, very informative. And I congratulate for this nice presentation and what we plan, I think if my Colleague uh, Professor Yash Mishra agrees that we can have a 10 minutes discussion at the end of the session and we continue with the next presenter. Would you, would you agree, Professor Mishra? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah, next so now, now I request you, request you to invite the next presenter. Is uh, Mudit Jain already joined or no? He has not uh, joined till now, so you can take Gautam Manan. Yeah, 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 please. But, uh, Professor Mishra, now I request you to invite Professor Gautam Menon. Well, uh, as uh, Modit Jain is not here, I would uh, like to invite uh, Professor Gautam Menon to make his presentation. As the, uh, you are around? Hello. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We can yeah. I just sure. need to be. I just need to be allowed to share my uh, my slides. Okay. The, certainly, something certainly. Has, to, has to be done at the IT end, I think. Abhinash, please, uh, Gautam Menon, see you. Bye. Yeah, please. I have given the right. Uh, to... Okay, you have given the right. I I think he has given the right. Please join. Okay, I'm just.
just go to share button uh, share near button. your screen below uh, near video i uh, just uh, select their screen one so it's not it seems to saying open system preferences yeah, for open something share, like that. no just uh, click on share button the share button is not coming up for me that is a problem oh, even okay. if i click there's nothing that i can click on it okay just wait a second again i'm giving you the right uh sir now check please it says allow webex events to record your computer screen and i'm no, sort no. of as far as i can share content share content button uh can you just mail to us your ppt so we can share for you sir sure i can do that just give me a minute okay uh, i'm what dropping my mail in my Help desk. E office help desk. Just give me one minute, and I will just mail it to you. Sure. sure. Do you have the mail, sir? Just if you will just tell me what the what it is, I'll just. Uh, just I am dropping in the chat option, sir. ठीक है. Just give me one minute, and I will. Uh... This was is e office dot help desk. Oh, ha yes sir. At the rate okay. IFS just, India yes. at the dot ac yes. dot in. Yes, and just just give me a minute. I have just sent it to you. It's about a fifteen MB file. And uh, sorry, apologies for this. I did not know that this would be a problem. Please don't feel tense. This is a virtual world, and we have to face all these problems. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Has this been received at your end? Uh, not yet, sir. Not yet. It's gone from here, but it's a it's a big file. Mudit had already shared PowerPoint with me, but he is not around. Whereas Gautam is around, but his PowerPoint is there. Yeah, I should have Mudit done this share. earlier. If you have his number, can you make a call, Doctor Say, to Mudit? Because it will be it will be early morning for him, I think. He's in. He the, might have. My, yeah, might have. He's with this. Google. He's with Google. Yeah. So I do not know where he is now. <laughs> Has my talk been received so far? Avinash. 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 Oh, not at man. So, no, you asked him for big, share button is open. Uh, is there share button is active right now? Can you? No, I think there is. There is something. This is a, this is a Mac. This is a Mac. Okay. So I don't know whether the Mac has. MacBook. Some MacBook right? have some problem. MacBook have uh -huh. some problem. Webex. Uh -huh. You need to download Mac related uh, Webex. Okay. Uh, sir, I have given Webex. the another email ID in the chat option. So can you just? Okay. ICT unit. Okay, I'll just send it there. Uh, sir, got it. Got it. Just a moment. Okay. It's a PDF file, so it should be easy for you to show. Yeah, thank you. That looks perfect. Okay, yeah. sir. 
Go ahead. Okay, so so I will tell you when to advance a slide. And so let me just sort of thank thank you, Dr. Okay. Pandey, Dr. Mishra, okay. and Dr. Sarjanissa for this invitation. I'm sorry for this uh, delay in starting. I want to tell you a little bit about work that we've done on modeling for COVID-19 in India. I will tell you about a bunch of different models. One is a standard epidemiological model. Then we have a, a network model that we're repurposing currently to look, look at vaccination questions. And then I will tell you about this very large scale uh, work that we are doing on making an agent based model for disease spread in India. So let's just go to the next slide. And um, in, the, in, in this slide, can we go ahead, please? Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so in this, this is work that is being done with the an, an, an organization called the the Indian Scientist Response to COVID-19. This is a group of about 500, 600 scientists from all across India who came at the time of the epidemic started. This is around early uh, February or March of 2020. And the idea was to essentially try to communicate scientific knowledge to the general public, look at things like who's busting, information about vaccines, information about the disease, how to protect oneself, and to do this in a bunch of Indian languages. So we prepared content in about 15, 20 different Indian languages, little video recordings, etc. And we also had a small subgroup that was working on modeling of COVID-19 in India. So here are a bunch of reports that were there. It's on our website of insightcov.in. The current version of the program that I will tell you about is a much more advanced version of the initial model that we worked on. I will describe that as we go along. So the next slide is, um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, this is the disease progression that this model starts with. It, of course, a factor, a major feature of COVID-19 is the fact that you can have asymptomatically infected people. So this is four different types of disease trajectories. You can have someone who's asymptomatic, becomes exposed, then passes through a limited period in which they remain infectious, and then they recover. Then you have people who are mildly infected who pass through a pre-symptomatic regime, then a mildly infected region where they show symptoms and then recover. Then there is severe and critical infections. If you're critical, there is a possibility that you will die. If you're severely infected, you will be hospitalized. So you move between pre-symptomatic, symptomatic, um, hospitalized, and then recovered. So in both severe and critical cases, there's a possibility of hospitalization. And the critical cases then move into a death compartment at some low probability. So this is the, a, a very general, broad description of, of disease progression in COVID-19. We take this and we put it into a compartmental model that's described in the next slide. Next slide, please. And this on the top left is the description of the model itself. You have a susceptible population that can become exposed to the infection if they contact any one of the infected categories. The exposed people can either go into the asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic infections. The pre-symptomatic can either go into the mild or severe. The severe can go to hospitalized. Hospitalized can go to either a death state or to a recovered state. And from the mild, from the mild infection, you go to the recovered state. There are rates that enter these. These rates are benchmarked to rates that are known from Italy, China, the US, as well as India. So where Indian information comes in is in the particular form of age structuring that we use, in the nature of IFRs that are believed to be appropriate to third world countries, to LMIC countries. We now define this model at the level of districts. We use simultaneous fits to both infections and deaths to make sure that we have the numbers correctly. There's a complicated nonlinear optimization that goes in using Bayesian methods to try and figure out what is the best fit to the data that we obtain, accounting for undercounting of cases, accounting for undercounting of deaths. So this is where the Bayesian methodology comes in. And these equations here are the equations that describe the dynamics of each individual compartment in terms of the picture that is shown on the top left. Next slide, please. So every one of the 740 odd districts in India is represented in this calculation. There is also currently available a, 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 a tool, a, online tool that you can use to test this out. So this is nine compartments. It's called a metapopulation model. It's age structured. So there are eight different age categories within that. It allows for migration. So you can allow migration between different districts. It's contact structured. So it takes information about contacts that are known from, from sort of nice work by a group by Jeep and company. And this is also includes factors such as healthcare accessibility can be put into that. The rates at which you move between the symptomatic to the hospitalized, et cetera, or you circumvent that entirely can be chosen to determine to be determined by some factor that could proportional to the quality of healthcare accessibility district wise. Please go on. Next slide, please. 
Next, next slide. So here is one example. So much of the work that we did initially was really guided to questions that we were being asked. What would be the impact of a limited lockdown, a long-term lockdown? What are different strategies of getting people back to work? For example, would a staggered lockdown work? So we looked at all of these questions in the context of this much more detailed model, and we were asked in many cases to, to provide this data to government. We also looked at questions of what was, did the lockdown, initial lockdown, did it work? Did it not work? How many lives were saved, et cetera? And then we also did models for Delhi, for Mumbai, for Chennai, for the large major cities. For the last few months, we have been working on a much more intense and, as I said, much more detailed version of this model. And much of our interaction now is with local governments, such as, for example, the government of Pune, governments of Karnataka, where we provide short-term forecasts for what might be happening. So here's an example for the for for the municipal corporation of um, Pune. We did a bunch of forecasts for how many hospitalizations that they might expect in the future. So the little gray band that you see is our projection for the hospitalizations that they would expect. This was done. So this is num this is calculated on the fourth, fourteenth of November. So you can see the number bend down within that particular range. Next slide, please. And by the time you get to Jan 2021, you see it still remain within the band. You see the slight increase now. And at this point, it has now moved a little bit outside. So this is the point where we will have to reparameterize these models again to see how far they work. In general, with any sort of modeling of this sort, it doesn't make sense to predict too far in advance. At most, you can trust these models for about a week to 10 days in advance. I'll give you one, one more example of this as we go on. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is our fits for Mumbai. You can see the characteristic peaks and troughs. So you have the daily infected on the top left and the daily death. So these are all predictive models where you try to predict one week in advance and you keep redoing this as more and more data seems to come in. And you can see that it captures the true complexity of the data in a fairly sensible way. There are different breakpoints that you can insert using likelihoods trying to optimize the likelihood function over here. And these breakpoints will might potentially tell you about changes in strategies, for example, localized lockdowns, et cetera, which are points where the reproductive ratio will change or the beta factor, the infectivity will change. Please go on. Next, next slide. So this is some work that we did recently for Karnataka. And this was done about three weeks ago, where you can see the peak and then the decline. And then the question was, what do you predict in the short term beyond the beyond the third of March, beyond the first of March, 2021? And that's the point where the cases had just begun to rise. Next slide, please. So you can see that little box, and this and this is the daily deaths. This is the prediction for daily deaths again? You can see where it fits in within the within the curve that we have shown. Next slide, please. And then we, we again, from, from about two to three weeks ago, this was where we said that we believe that this would come down because the, the theory would predict that decrease. So we said this is a temporary fluctuation. The likelihood at this point is that you would see a decrease, and this was told to them. But then we recalibrated the model about a week ago with the new data that had been coming. And as you know, through much of India, we're seeing an increase in cases. So the recalibration is on the next slide. Please go ahead. Next slide, please. And there you can see the slow uptick, and that's what the models are predicting, that increase that you see on the right-hand side. And for the daily infected, you can now see that it has left the downtrend that we had predicted earlier, three weeks earlier. And now we believe that we're on the uptrend in Karnataka. We don't know how far that will go. So every week to week, we have to redo this based on the data that is available, based on our parameterization. Although one advantage that we have is because we have run these models from the beginning, we know the numbers of people who are infected. So we know how close or how far we are from herd immunity, we know how close our far we are from the turn down that we would normally expect. So we at least, we don't expect it to rise as fast because many people have already been affected, especially in more urban areas of Karnataka. But this is how we, you, how you can look at inputs to policy based on modeling that is really done over a short term, one week to two weeks at a time. Please go ahead. Next slide, please. I want to tell you a little bit about a bird's eye view of other work that we have been doing. One is an epidemiological compartmental model that we use to study testing strategies and are now readapting to vaccine strategies. I'll tell you how these can be used for vaccination policy. And then I will describe the agent based model that we've been working with. It's called Bharatsan. Next slide, please. So to remind, so, okay, so the first thing that we did is a compartmental model that looks at vaccination. This is with a group of people across Harvard, a bunch of people in Johns Hopkins, et cetera. And we have been looking at vaccine allocation strategies in India using mathematical modeling. 
Next slide, please. And the service is age structured. It has accounts for both sterilizing and non-sterilizing immunity. That is to say, if you vaccinate people, is it more likely? Are they equally likely to infect other people or are they less likely to infect other people? Okay. We look at four strategies. One is to give vaccines uniformly across the population. The other is to target it to 20 or 40 years, 40 to 60 years, or first give it to greater than 60 years. So in strategies two to four, we first vaccinate the target population, then we distribute what is left according to the ratio of the populations and the other age groups. We base this on the population structure of several Indian states and the contact matrices that are believed to be appropriate. Next slide, please. So we can do this and sort of ask what is the impact of, of mort on mortality, both of having sterilizing immunity, both if you have sterilizing immunity provided by vaccines and non-sterilizing immunity provided by vaccines. And it turns out consistent with what the government has been doing, the strategy four, prioritizing elderly people leads to the greatest reduction in deaths. Prioritizing younger people leads to an overall reduction in the number of infections, but does not have much of an effect on the number of deaths. So currently, the, the, consistent with both what the WHO is saying, as well as Indian government policy, we can benchmark this against our models and look at different levels of coverage, vaccine coverage, et cetera, and show that this is the right thing to do. Next slide, please. So this supports the recommendations to prioritize. So this is the WHO recommendation to prioritize vaccine allocation for older results. As I said, there's a greater impact on reducing incidence if you prioritize younger people. But on the other hand, you don't change mortality very much with that strategy. Next slide, please. So the other work that we have been doing apart from that is to look at network models for testing. And to remind you, when we test for COVID-19 in India, we use two types of tests. One is a medium accuracy test, which is the RAT test, and the other is a high accuracy test, which is more costly, which is the RT-PCR test. The RAT test is a lateral flow assay test, which is immediately available. Within about 15 minutes, you get your results. The PCR test, in addition to be costly, in involves some amount of delay, especially if the test has to be taken to a lab that is some distance away from where the sample was actually taken. So now there are many trade-offs involved. What is the quantum of testing that you might recommend? What is the mixture of RAT and PCR tests that you might recommend? What is the relative sensitivity of tests that is also a factor? If you had RAT tests that was as sensitive as the PCR test, then you would have no difficulty at all because you're deciding to go over a completely RAT regime and also prioritize who to test. So this is all questions that we looked at in, our, in a recent preprint. Next slide, please. So the model here is a network model where you describe homes, a network of people interacting in homes, a network of people interacting in workplaces, people who fall ill and can go to hospitals, people who fall ill, come back home. And then we describe different types of quarantining regimes for these people. For example, if someone is symptomatic, you can quarantine either them or you can quarantine the whole house as a whole, limit the amount to which they can actually come out. And then you can ask how does the disease spread through the network? Are hospital care workers, are healthcare workers more likely to be infected? What are the larger scale consequences of this with different testing regimes? So that's exactly what we did. And I can summarize what we've done in the next two slides. Next slide, please. The sort of question that we can ask is, at a particular level of testing, say 0.1% of the population per day, 0.8%, 0.5%, 0.05%, et cetera. If you tested at that level with a certain mix of RATs and PCR, so over here you can see on, on the picture to the right, you can see RAT sensitivity on one axis, fraction of RATs on the other axis, and the number of infections that are prevented by testing on the z-axis. So at levels of 0.1% and 0.5 testing, you can reduce the number of people infected at the end of the pandemic by this huge amount that you see. If you did not test at all, if you just let the pandemic run through, that number would be at about 0 0.65 to 0.7%. So 0.1% testing is not taking you anywhere very much. 0.5 testing, you can really suppress that 65% to about 25%. So the end result is that the quantum of testing is very important. Right now, India is testing less than 0.1%, but if we push it up to 0.5%, we can make it very, we can make it very impactful, our testing. Timing of where you are relative to the epidemic is also important. The mix of tests is not particularly important. Even if you have 60% RATs, you're actually okay at reasonable levels of sensitivity. And it's less important, except if it's significantly low. And if, you're, if your sensitivity of the test is about 60, 70%, then you're actually okay. And this is interesting because states such as this ongoing discussion about how is it possible to have tests of low sensitivity and not and not sort of miss large numbers of cases. You can compensate for that by testing more, which is really what we point out in this paper. Next slide, please. So we've extended this. So we are now currently funded by the WHO immunization groups to look at, to examine how vaccination models can be helped 
to open schools, for example, to look at communities to decide who to prioritize. So you can see that you can extend these models very easily to thinking about a community in which schools are embedded. You can say that the school children interact within each class. There are teachers that move between classes. The children move back at homes where they may or may not be infected or can transfer the infection to home. So now you can decide what are the what is a good strategy? Is it good to, to vaccinate the teachers? Is it good to vaccinate some fraction of the students? What is the fraction of vaccination that which it begins to make a difference? Should you prioritize elderly people at homes? And all of this with an idea of network structure of community interaction, you can now develop a proper vaccination model. Next slide, please. The last thing that I want to talk about in another two or three minutes is a very large program called Bharatsan. And this is a combination of Ashoka University where I work with a company called ThoughtWorks that is Pune based, which is a high-end engineering company. So these are agent-based models, which are probably the most detailed way of describing how, you know, they're, they're used for many things. They use for economic models, for social models, but they're also used for disease models. What you need is a combination of a computational model to simulate agents, how they transfer infection between each other. You need to describe agents, networks of, of agent interaction, and you need synthetic population for agents. The synthetic population for agents, I think, is something that will interest all of you at the IAPS more specifically. So I'll describe that in the next slide. Next slide, please. So what we want to do is to describe a synthetic population for India. And to do this, you have to integrate multiple data sources, surveys that tell you gender, age, family size, and socioeconomic data, healthcare access, ed education, et cetera. What we do is work with computer scientists here and across the country to use machine learning methods that synthesize these distributions. And the real hope is to make such a good synthetic population that you cannot tell it apart from survey data and you can improve it by using further survey data that we obtain from a bunch of different foundations that provide us anonymized data that we can use to interpret this. Once we have models such as this and they're very close to being finalized, we can test the vaccine strategies at a much more granular resolution, including social economic determinants of who decides to go into vaccine, go in for a vaccine depending upon the socioeconomic status. So that's my last slide is the next slide, I think, which is just uh, yeah, so I've told you about a bunch of different things. I told you about the incisive model, which is a very large scale, very standard, but much more detailed epidemiological compartmental model. I told you how it is going to be repurposed for vaccination. I described networks models for testing and how they're going to be repurposed to look at vaccination strategies. And I described this very big piece of work that we've been doing for the last six to eight months, which is the development of Bharatsan. A whole bunch of people are involved. This is all my collaborators are listed over there. I have collaborators with computer scientists at Ashoka University, with ThoughtWorks, with a bunch of people at ISC and ISI in Bangalore, Pune Smart City, and a bunch of collaborators across India in different aspects of this. Thank you very much. And I apologize for this difficulty with my slides, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thanks, Gautam. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Menon, for this nice presentation. And I think it was a very, very important piece of work, particularly related to India. And when this pandemic started, I think it was the very pertinent question for us that how long this particular pandemic is going to end, what will be the duration, and for how long people will be suffering, and what will be the number tomorrow or day after tomorrow. And I think your work has uh, a good answer, a fairly uh, appropriate answer to these questions, which were in the minds of common people. So thank you for presenting this nice piece of work for elaborating on your technology. And we will be having some discussion at the end of the talk. Thank you very much. So, uh, Professor Mishra, may I request you to invite the next speaker, Rajiv Acharya. Yes. Uh, now, uh, I think, uh, Saeed, we didn't get Modit yet, so we will start with Rajiv's presentation. Yes, yes may please. I welcome? Yes, yeah, may yes, I welcome please. Rajiv yes. to start his presentation? Rajiv? Rajiv, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Let's yes. try to okay. share please. my screen. Uh, you see how he's sharing happening for you. Just try. Ah. It can. Oh, can you see Great. my slide? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pandey, Dr. Mishra. Uh, thank you, other speakers who already spoke about some of the models. Uh, so, uh, from the start of the pandemic, when people were trying to 
predict how many cases would be there next day, two months later, six months later, uh, and, and showing a big, uh, showing those scary pictures to us. Uh, we, uh, me and my colleague Akash Porwal were trying to look at uh, the problem in some other way. So we didn't try to predict number of cases or something. Instead, we were trying to see how we could help the government in, in uh, allocating resources by, by identifying those areas, those according to our model would be more vulnerable than the others. Uh, this work was published in the Lancet uh, in July uh, 16th edition. How do I move forward? So uh, I don't have to give a background because we all know when we did actually this work, uh, India was uh, in a very uh, fast paced uh, time for coronavirus uh, infections. And that time I remember it was 19% of world cases were in India and 10% of world's deaths. And today when I looked at the data again, it is 9.5% of world's cases and 5.9% of world's deaths, which is great that we could reduce our share by slowing down the pandemic at least for some few months although i know it is uh, going up a little bit again in the beginning of the pandemic uh, in 2020 government of india for efficient preparedness and response to the pandemic enacted two laws one by the central government that's called national disaster management act and some state governments also enacted a very old uh, act called Epidemic Diseases Act. Now you can ask me why in the modeling I'm talking about uh, this act, because these acts give central and state power to manage any disaster. And we are in the next slide going to use disaster management framework to look at the vulnerability of the population uh, for corona, corona infection. Now, this is a very famous uh, equation, very simple, famous equation in disaster management. So uh, where we define risk as uh, the ability of a population to absorb or ultimately recover from the effect of a hazard, and the hazard is defined as the exposure to an event that might present a great threat to its people and economy. In our case, this is coronavirus attack. Given the level of vulnerability that we are going to discuss today and the resources they have, to mitigate the hazard. There could be different uh, resources. It could be immunity, it could be financial resources, it could be health infrastructure, anything. So, uh, so, so this is the equation that we are going to talk about. And many people think vulnerability is risk, which is not. And you can see in this equation, vulnerability is actually a factor that determines risk from a disastrous event. So we go by that, uh, uh, you know, um, framework uh, in next. We extended this concept of vulnerability for the COVID. How did we extend it? Uh, we, uh, we, we thought that this is more of a contributing, more contributing factor, uh, uh, for a, a factor that is more contributing than actually risk of contracting diseases. It can have economic implications. It can have, can have other kinds of implications, mental health, many other things. So, so this is more than actually contracting the disease. It's a dynamic concept. Population, a population that might be vulnerable at the beginning of the epidemic may not be vulnerable at the beginning of the epidemic, but subsequently become vulnerable depending on the government response. For example, a poor person who had no international travel or something, but not really vulnerable to have the, uh, or had there any risk of contracting the disease, but because he, he lost job or, or had other kind of issues uh, and uh, due to lack of government response to their needs, they may become vulnerable. So it's a dynamic concept. The uh, second, third thing is the population uh, may be vulnerable as they struggle to cope with the crisis in three different ways. They can try to struggle financially, mentally, or even physically. So they become more and more vulnerable or less vulnerable. Uh, now, vulnerability is not, is not a new concept, and particularly socioeconomic vulnerability is definitely not a new concept. It is a concept used by US CDC for a long time to measure the resilience of communities when faced with natural or man-made disasters, like a storm or a 
uh, or a tornado or something, they use this model to identify the vulnerable communities. Sargo Foundation, after the coronavirus uh, started, they extended this SVI, concept of social vulnerability index, to COVID-19 related vulnerability. They did it for USA and Africa. In our study, we report vulnerability index to specially identify a state, specially identify vulnerable population at the state and district level, based on several domains of vulnerability uh, 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 to help the community, uh, particularly the government, the community to prepare for, to mitigate, respond to, or recover from the epidemic. Uh, the concept is actually a multidimensional concept, and we followed uh, great work by Flanagan 2011, based on which uh, CDC uh, developed their uh, vulnerability, uh, social vulnerability index, and has has been using from since since then. However, we reconstructed the domains of vulnerability that CDC defined uh, that reflected the risk of COVID-19 epidemic, and these domains are socioeconomic vulnerability, demographic vulnerability, housing and uh, hygiene related vulnerability, vulnerability due to non-availability of healthcare, and finally, epidemiological vulnerability. And I think given the data, epidemiological vulnerability that you could calculate is probably the weakest of all five domains. Uh, nevertheless, these are the five domains and little detail about this domain. So socioeconomic domain has three variables, three manifested manifest variables. Household belonging to STSC, uh, population with uh, or uh, with secondary or high level of education or the reverse of it. Asset deprivation index we calculated from uh, different uh, position uh, that people have. Then you have dem demographic domain. We know that people over 60 years are uh, more uh, susceptible to death uh, due to coronavirus. So that population, urbanization is a definitely a big threat to um, in, in terms of COVID, so that and population density, as you know, more dense population is that there is higher chance of disease spread, spreading faster. Then uh, we have housing, housing and hygiene domain. We are looking at uh, inter-household crowding. We look at the sanitation facility, including hand hygiene. Uh, we look at the availability of healthcare. Another weak domain. We don't have great data on that, although. We have some data on health insurance from NFHS. Uh, household without access to public health facilities, another variable from NFHS that we can have. Availability of public hospitals, um, uh, which is 100,000 population, the upper 100,000 population. This is at the district level available, and hospital beds at the state level, 5,000 population. We use these uh, indicators for defining availability of healthcare. Epidemiological domain, very weak because we have some information of tonic mobility of men and women from NFHS data that we used, and men with smoking habit that we use. Overall, there were 15 indicators uh, to define vulnerability across these 15, five domains, and we calculated uh, this first at the district level, and the mean of the districts will give you a state, and then we go to the next level of computing the uh, uh, indices. If uh, use the following data, the NFHS 2015 16 census 2011, we don't have anything more, uh, but we projected population from census 2011, so we had some projection. Uh, then rural health statistics and national health profile 2019. How do we, how do, do we compute? It's a super easy uh, computation. Um, the first we arrange the indicators in ascending or descending order, such a way that higher value denotes higher vulnerability. And then we rank, uh, assign rank to each of the districts or the state, whichever level we are working on. Percentile rank was then calculated uh, as a percentage of districts or states uh, at or below the rank scoring, uh, rank score using the following formula. You know, the formula is simple, P equals to rank minus one divided by N minus one. Uh, and and then we calculated that uh, uh, vulnerability, relative vulnerability at different level, at indicator level, at domain level, and then summing them uh, at the 
percentile uh, rank of, of all the uh, domain percentiles into the uh, overall ranking. I come to the state uh, finding. These are a little older findings because this was published in July. Although, as I said, that these data are fixed data. They did not change whether it was uh, in July 2020 or now that we don't have more data on this. So, uh, the, our uh, uh, the number of cases changed, but uh, vulnerability did not change in our model because there was no dynamic data in our model. Uh, if you look at these four uh, graphs, uh, six, six of them graphs, I just showed the four of them. Nine out of 36 states and UTs had more than 0.75 overall vulnerability, which ran through, you know, the center uh, from the east to west. You know, from the east to in West Bengal, then Jharkhand and Bihar in the central Madhya Pradesh towards and then west is uh, Maharashtra. And here you have uh, Chhattisgarh. So these were the highest vulnerable uh, states. 14 out of, out of the 36 states and UTs, of them, five from the northeastern state, then HP, Goa, Kerala, five UTs, and Chhattisgarh, uh, they had low vulnerability, um, uh, vulnerability that is less than uh, 0 0.4. Uh, at that point of time, there were eight uh, states uh, who are contributing most number of cases. One of them is still there, Maharashtra, for example, Kerala, for example. Out of the eight states contributing most cases at that time, five were highly, highly vulnerable, three were medium vulnerable. And this domain vulnerability, um, if you look at the, uh, the last three pictures, uh, the, those look at the domain vulnerability. First one is socioeconomic, second one is housing and hygiene, and last one is demographic. And if you look at the <coughs> last one particularly, you can see Kerala, Punjab, uh, these are very high demographic vulnerability, but very low on other indicators. So this is this is a, a very interesting, uh, you know, finding to look at the domain level vulnerabilities. These are district level findings. Uh, overall, if you look at the hundred most vulnerable districts, most of the districts are from uh, the states where we expected them from like 33 from UP, 34 from Bihar, 20 from Madhya Pradesh, uh, 7 from West Bengal, and 8 from Jharkhand. You know, uh, if you also look very carefully in these maps, uh, all the major metro cities, Mumbai, Chennai, Kolkata, Delhi, Bangalore, they actually rank low medium, uh, low to medium in vulnerability, but actually that time reported greatest number of cases at that point of time. And they were, uh, as they were uh, the transport and industrial hub where the spread was much faster and wider. Uh, then uh, at that point of time, there were a uh, lot of discussion about return mobility of the low wage workers from the family, from the low vulnerable, but high number of cases places, for example, Mumbai, Maharashtra, uh, to uh, the, uh, districts with high vulnerability but uh, low case at that point of time, that was of concern. For for example, at that time, many of the Bihar and UP districts were with very low number of cases. And then people were coming from Punjab or uh, coming from uh, Kerala or uh, Maharashtra. Mm, so from the high vulnerable districts or high low case load districts. So that was something that was uh, very uh, concerning at that time. This is uh, for interest I we just did. These are aspirational districts. Those are colored districts, not the ash colored districts. So gray colored districts are, you can forget about them. The other districts are aspirational districts. And if we look at the aspirational districts, particularly for the socioeconomic vulnerability, those are a lot of those districts have uh, elevated vulnerability. Uh, most of, mostly on socioeconomic and also on the overall vulnerability. Now, what is the use of this index? I'm just giving you two simple examples. One example of Samastipur districts of Bihar, which has an overall vulnerability of 0.998, almost in the highest five. And uh, their socioeconomic vulnerability is 0.8. Uh, demography is very low, but all other as 0.87 or more. Uh, where we compare that with Kozikor in Kerala, 
where all the vulnerability, domain level vulnerability are low, including the overall, but demographic and epidemiological vulnerability are high. So what the district magistrate of Samastipu with this information can do? For example, for Samastipu, they should strengthen the overall uh, you know, campaign on, on this, go house to house, give information, give this poor people economic support, work further on the hygiene issues, because they are vulnerable on those issues. Uh, campaign on the COVID effects on smoker sales, for example, though, or those with comorbidities. Uh, strengthen the health facilities because you need uh, immediate support to the families who will get some infection at some point mm -hmm. of time. So build those. Then uh, what can the do? DM of Cozy Code? He cannot really rest because even his, his overall vulnerability is low. There is high demographic vulnerability or high epidemiological vulnerability. So it needs special care, special program for those with comorbidities, needs support, especially for older population. You know, there are a lot of uh, old age homes in Kerala. They need to work on those people so that the disease does not spread there. Uh, but there are some interesting point uh, I would like to say about this, um, this index. Uh, uh, first one is the concept of uh, susceptibility versus vulnerability, they sound very similar, and many people ask me this, uh, but they are not actually the same. Susceptibility is actually more to do with the risk of catching con infection, and vulnerability is more to do with the consequence of the infection. So morbidity, mortality, or the social, <laughs> social and economic consequences um, that comes along with the disease. Then uh, whether we should have a relative versus an absolute score, uh, there's a debate on that and the index we present is a relative index why we did that because we thought that an absolute rather than an absolute uh, score a relative index is more useful because the ultimate goal is to prioritize resource depending on the problem at hand so it will be easier to uh, prioritize resource if you give a relative um, score uh, then use versus uh, use of uh, weights versus non-use of weight this is a very debatable uh, thing. We also debated ourselves when we are constructing. But at the end of the day, we wanted this, uh, you know, index to be very simple, replicable, interpretable, comprehensible. And that's why we decided against using any, uh, you know, uh, any types of weight, particularly factor weights, which are really recommended in this kind of models. They are problematic because they are too sensitive to data. You change the data a bit, there's a lot of change can happen. They, they do not have very easy interpretability. And of course, replicability is an issue, but we thought that this can be replicable at the lower level by people who actually work at that level. So we wanted it to be very simple and did not use any way. Uh, there's a question that which one to use? You have give, we have given overall versus and domain vulnerability, which one to use? We recommend that they use uh, overall in this particularly, but alongside the domain specific vulnerability in this. Just before two slides, before I gave you example that how overall index for Kuji score was low, but uh, two domain specific vulnerability score was very high. So they should work on those areas. So it it, it should be uh, used along with the overall uh, index. Uh, so the next one uh, I would like to talk about is that limitation, of course. Our um, index is not without limitation. We could calculate uh, only up to district level, but actually further lower level index would have been more useful because uh, uh, it is probably the block level or the sub district level, the mitigation efforts is the most and uh, most important. However, for example, the CDC uses this data at the census track level. You can imagine how low level they can go they could go with the data availability that they have. So that was more useful for them and we could, would have loved to do that at the lower level. And we still still can do if we had some indicators from somewhere at the district level and improve them using a small area estimation technique, but that is still not available with us. Our data, if you see the dates of the data, two to five years old. So some of the districts may have changed recently and on some aspects, somebody like Deoghar district magistrate said to me that, uh, you know, you, you said that Deoghar is very vulnerable on health, but we have had two very 
high level uh, health facilities came in, came up just before the corona started. So our health district is not really vulnerable in terms of health. So some stuff changes could have happened, you know. So uh, we don't capture those changes. The epidemic after the epidemic has started, you know, government has augmented um, health facilities. They had those two months of lockdown to do all those things. They augmented health facilities with more beds, quarantine facilities, isolation wards. And uh, and then uh, these things, there's no record which districts and how many and all those things. So they were not part of our calculation. Uh, we had, if we had those in, in things, we could have made a dynamic model, you know, out of that. And, and the, there's no information available. Uh, some people told me that, you know, the hygiene data that used uh, uh, were before uh, the um, government of India's program started on hygiene. Uh, that 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 new thing, that number of toilets we built and those, we don't have those information. So our information is a little older. Uh, it is indicative that it could have been improved if we had better data. Our index DAS is based on fixed data points, as I said in the beginning. It's, however, a dynamic index with updated information on rapid changing, rapidly changing uh, health system, availability of testing facility, type of test available, would have been more useful uh, if we could do and make a dynamic uh, model for the vulnerability. Uh, finally, the fact that we are unable to study sub-district level uh, uh, then at the smaller area um, actually cause for some overall in our data ecosystem. We need more granular level data to uh, have some response to this kind of crisis in the future. And this is more recent. We, we are now thinking of extending the model to the vaccine distribution. You know, we think the indices we develop can be used for vaccines vaccine allocation. That time it was for resource allocation. We can use similar concept in vaccine allocation. In fact, majority of the US states are actually using uh, SVI, you know, uh, the social vulnerability index to arrive at efficient and equitable allocation of COVID-19 uh, vaccines in US United States. National Academies of Science, Engineering, Medicine, which has made a strategy of vaccine allocation, they actually advise the states to use such index. We are suggesting the same, and we can develop this uh, by, uh, and this use of this index could be to prioritize the vulnerable groups, districts or regions, to larger shares of vaccine, you know, uh, to define the priority groups in phase system that we already have, to plan for tailored outreach and communication to the population, to reduce vaccine hesitancy, to plan for the location of dispensing sites, and to monitor the uptake of vaccine. All those are important now in the next few months. This can be used, uh, this index can be used. I'm already asking some information for the government so that we can notify this and, uh, you know, we can send this date, this work to the National Task Force uh, to use it for the vaccine allocation. So far, we actually, before it was published in Lancet, we shared this with National Task Force force which was constituted by the government of India and I was told that it was they were using this some of this information in their uh, you know mitigation plan. Few state governments had taken note because the study was highly widely reported in print and electronic media in India and outside so they had taken note and uh, uh, worked on those. Uh, we have uh, in our non-profit um, website uh, you know, publish the interactive maps, people can use that. And we also spoke at different forums, like at today I am uh, speaking, we already had some other wider dissemination with UNFPA, uh, UNICEF, WHO, and many other places, uh, so that uh, this, uh, this can be disseminated. Thank you so much. Look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Radhi Acharya, for this nice presentation. And uh, I think it was very eye opening, and you had very relevant point to be put up for the policymakers that how you can decide about the areas which are more vulnerable and need uh, uh, focus for the containment of this particular pandemic. So we had 
a variety of presentations right from our district Nivas to Rajiv Acharya and still we are waiting for Mudit Jain and uh, if, uh, Dr. Saeed has some praise of uh, Mudit Jain, yeah. we can we can invite him at the end of the session and then after that we can start closing the discussions. So he has not joined, so what we can do, we can start the discussion and I have asked other attendees also to make them as panel members so they can ask questions directly to the people. Okay, thank you. So I think we are missing Mudit Jain and we had these three excellent speakers and they uh, presented the different facets of the COVID pandemic. Oh, oh, oh. And Mudit Jain, Mudit Jain, Mudit Jain. Wonderful. Uh, uh, great, 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 great. Hello. Hello, Mudit. Yeah, yeah. Please, uh, Mudit, you can invite him. Welcome, Mudit. Welcome, welcome. So, we are waiting for you and. Uh, I was, in fact, going to conclude the session, but uh, we are fortunate that we got you at the end of that uh, point. So, without wasting much time, I invite Mudit Jain for his presentation. Hi. Uh, uh, so, actually, it's very early in the morning here, so I was a little late. Uh, sorry about that. My, I was guessing that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a it's a very difficult for IT people to work in early morning. Right? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good observation. <laughs> um, so are you able to see my slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have to present? Uh, about uh, fifteen minutes. Uh, if you want okay. to take more time, we can extend up to twenty minutes. Okay, yeah, 15 to 20 minutes is great. I'll yeah. complete within that. All right, so I will get started. Um, so the topic of my presentation is uh, COVID forecasting and using uh, machine learning to extend the SEIR models. And uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Doctor Saeed, she told me that people are already familiar with SEIR models. Um, but just very, very briefly, uh, this is what they look like. We have four states, uh, susceptible, exposed, infected, and um, recovered. Mm -hmm. And we have a set of differential equations <laughs> to, to, um, uh, to uh, model uh, movement of population between these four states. And then we also have uh, several uh, coefficients such as uh, beta, uh, mu, um, epsilon, and gamma. Uh, but I'll so I so I won't go into detail of uh, these equations themselves. What I'll talk about is the lim their limitations. Um, so there are several limitations. Um, first one is that the number of states are limited. So there's only four states. Um, second one is that these differential equation coefficients they are static. They are uh, not uh, dynamic based on the location and not dynamic based on the time. So it, they don't change over time, even if the nature of the disease propagation is changing over time. Third issue is that they're not there's no direct dependence on real world factors. So they are mostly set by experience or by empirical observation or by trying to fit the data, but there is no automatic dependence on real world factors such as uh, movement of people or um, uh, let's say the actual uh, spread of the disease or um, uh, economic indicators or health indicators. Uh, so that's uh, one other more constraint. Uh, the fourth problem is it does not update automatically. So as I said, it because it's static, uh, it does not change on its own to become more accurate over time. Manual intervention is needed. And the last problem is uh, this is not scalable to multiple locations while sharing these parameters. So what that means is um, each location is different. 
Uh, so, um, for example, but, but each location is different, but also similar in some ways. So, for example, the pop, the COVID spread in Maharashtra versus, let's say, Rajasthan would be um, similar, but also different. So, we want to capture the similarity, but also want to uh, give give each place its own uniqueness. Uh, and that's not possible with the traditional SEIR model. So we, in the next slides, I explain how we tackle this. Uh, we, we extend the SEIR model to tackle all these limitations. Okay, so the first limitation we talked about was that the number of states is uh, limited. So what we did was, um, so, okay, actually I forgot. So let me just very briefly introduce myself. So I'm a software engineer at Google. Uh, before that, I was at Microsoft. And this work was uh, while uh, like in collaboration with a team at Google, a research team at Google. And we implemented this work and were a finalist in a recently organized COVID prediction challenge. Um, so that's, that's the work I'm describing. And the link to this work is available at this uh, link below. If you search for Google COVID-19 forecast, you'll find it. Okay, going back to the actual work. So yeah, the first uh, step that we do is extend the number of SEIR states. Uh, we, in addition to SEIR, we also add several others such as undocumented states, such as undocumented infected, uh, undocumented covered, because in a lot of cases, a uh, lot of cases will just be asymptomatic and will not even be D discovered as infected or discovered as recovered. In addition, um, for the documented recovered, we further split it into several states. So states like hospitalized um, and a more serious version of hospitalized, which is ICU, and a more serious, sorry, serious version of uh, IC ICU, which is ventilator. And then finally, uh, of course, there would be deaths. So the recovered has been split into these four uh, states. And last but not the least, because people eventually do get vaccinated. So we want to add that state as well. Um, and this helps us model more realistically and more accurately. One consequence of adding these states is that we also have many more of these uh, coefficients, these rate coefficients. So I've mentioned those like, um, so we'll have documented and undocumented contact rate, uh, inverse incubation periods, recovery rates, vaccination rate, so on. So the consequence of that is the number of equations become much larger. Uh, I won't explain all these equations, but just take two very simple examples to uh, explain what's going on. So this is the, just like in the normal SEIR equation, this part shows the uh, movement of cases from susceptible to exposed. So this is very similar, which is the beta documented multiplied by infect documented of the previous time step plus beta undocumented uh, multiplied by infected undocumented. Infected undocumented is the asymptomatic cases which didn't get detected. Uh, so we, those are the cases from susceptible which the infected people came in contact with and infected them. Uh, the rest of this normalization, uh, so multiplication with susceptible and the normalization with population. So that's very similar to the normal SEIR equation. So this people who got infected by, susceptible people who got infected by coming in contact, uh, they in this new equation are expressed by this. And this is the exact term that moves into the, uh, to the exposed uh, category. So they got exposed and they might or might not get infected. Um, very similarly, uh, this is the number of people who were hospitalized. So from among the people who were infected and documented, 
a fraction of them will be serious enough to get hospitalized. So we have a, a term for that. So I'm not going to like I'm not explaining all the terms uh, because this is quite complex. Uh, so, but I'll take examples of these two coefficients, beta and the H in future. That's why I'm explaining them here. Uh, so yeah, this is the list of all the new coefficients that we created and their description. So contact numbers, read infections, uh, inverse latency period, hospitalization, ICU ventilation rate, recovery and death. Um, the now because we have so many new variable so many new coefficients it's now even more difficult to set them manually or with empirical evidence the only way we to tackle this problem is through data and to uh, set them automatically is through machine learning uh, using that data so for data what we do is we use these covariates uh, which uh, um, uh, which basically are things like uh, mob mobility measures that how much people are moving, uh, interventions, uh, which is governmental interventions like lockdowns, density of people, uh, demographic information, healthcare information, testing information, and so on. Um, I'll explain, I'll take a, examples of these i think that's what dr said said is most interested most interesting to the audience um the next thing is as i said we want to estimate these coefficients using uh, using uh, data so the form that we use for estimation is a linear model uh, what this equation at below shows is each parameter is being estimated each coefficient is being estimated by this equation where these terms VIL, VIU, and uh, these are supposed to be lower and upper bound of each coefficient. And then the data dependent term is defined by the second part, which is the sigmoid function. Uh, and inside there, we have a linear function uh, where we have a C plus BI plus a linear multiplication of some weights and the covariates. So the real world factors, I'm calling them covariates. Uh, and then I'll explain the reasons for this linear equations. Um, uh, so there is a question. Should I take the questions towards the end or right now? No, at the end, at the end. Okay, okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so this linear equation uh, there are the reason why we have a linear equation is there are several benefits to it uh, so each coefficient that we have is now dynamic it's location and time dependent so as new data comes in this part inside which is this uh, which is the linear uh, coefficients multiplied by covariates that keeps changing at each time step and is different also at each time step. So, uh, sorry, at each location. Uh, so the data, uh, so, so the coefficients become location and time dependent um, and they're automatically set by the data. We keep the function as a linear function so that it's interpretable much more easily by epidemiologists. Uh, one option is to also use a more complex mo uh, machine learning model like a neural network or a decision tree or something else, but those are less interpretable. So we used a linear model. Um, as I said, it updates, uh, we can train it as often as we want. So whatever is the frequency of our data update, if it's every day, then we can update it every day. Uh, one last point is we, in addition to having uh different poss possibility of uh, different uh, coefficient every with every location and with the end with every day we also allow some sharing to happen so we have two parameters here b i and c uh, so c is a global uh, parameter which is uh, uh, which is the um, uh, which is common across all locations and all time 
uh, it's a global bias parameter for this coefficient. And B i is a coefficient dependent. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, I thought someone is asking something. Um, okay. So the B i is the uh, parameter dependent on location and it's independent of time. So bias uh, variable for uh, uh, for a location. Um, so we basically allow this uh, sharing to happen for the same for a given location across all times and sharing to happen for all locations across all times and then also allow differences to be accounted for with this uh, covariate linear multiplication. Uh, now coming to the actual features that are used uh, for these uh, uh, for these coefficients, so we call them as covariates. Uh, in uh, uh, I mean, we could as call them features or covariates. When I say that, it's the same thing. So the features or covariates that we used are all from public sources, but we could use uh, private as well. There is no restriction to that, and uh, the features are demographic information such as uh, population, like the total population, density of population, population in different age groups, like 0 to 20, 20 to 60 bucket, 60 to 70, 70 plus, uh, and number of households. Uh, second category is health indicators, such as the number of hospitals, doctors, ICU beds available, quality of hospitals. Third one, economic indicators, such as uh, poverty line population, population with access to insurance, population with access to hospitals. Uh, so these are static uh, static uh, covariates of static features. They don't change uh, every day. They may be changed once every year or maybe less than that, less often than that. Uh, what the two most important features that we used are these two at the bottom. Uh, one is mobility indicator. So this one is basically like Google Maps data. Uh, so this is coming from Google Maps data. Uh, just like we have traffic density on Google Maps, uh, we can also get density for different categories of places, such as workplaces, transit places, uh, parks, uh, public places like parks, uh, schools, homes, and like few like five, six categories of such places. Um, so that tells us how much is actually, how much is the real movement? Like in addition to what the government wants, what whatever the government policy is, what's the actual situation that we come to know from this data. Uh, last one is the search trends data, which is anon again, similar to above, but this is anonymized Google search data where people, and it measures how many people are searching for COVID and COVID related, related symptoms. So they, they might not know that they have COVID, but they might talk about like shortness of breath or coughing or tiredness or loss of taste, something, some uh, like terms like that. So we measure those. Uh, now, the interesting part is all of the, like these features, they don't all each feature does not affect each uh, each uh, coefficient. So, like I show examples here, the mobility the Google Maps mobility data, which I talked about, that only affects the average contact rate. So, the number of people that documented infected and documented un undocumented infected people, how many. Uh, are they how many how much are they moving how much disease are they spreading uh, so it's like this <clears throat> d and beta beta d and beta u parameter similarly uh, this uh, number of uh, test convert tests uh, done by the government or like tests done in that location they are they only affect these two parameters which is the number of uh, i think one is this hospitalization rate, H, as I said earlier, and the second one is 
uh, number of people who are diagnosed. So infected undocumented to infected documented. So diagnosis rate and hospitalization rate, they are affected by number of tests. Uh, so for all these other covariates, we come up, uh, like we manually come up with hypothesis and some expert, we did some experimentation and hypothesis on what variables they would affect uh, and uh, sorry, what uh, coefficients they would affect. And we use only, uh, we use them only for those coefficient linear model. So here are the other ones, which I again won't go into more detail. I just discussed those beta and H as some simple examples. Uh, next one is, so this is a little more deeper into the machine learning. I, I think I might, I might like, I think I'm close to the 15 minute limit. So I'll just very briefly talk about it. Uh, so in machine learning, we have this concept called loss function and regularization functions, which enable us to, um, which basically tells the machine learning model, what is the parameter we are trying to optimize and how do we want to optimize it? So in our case, the parameters are predicting numbers like infected, documented, uh, 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 this, um, uh, hospitalized, ICU, ventilator, death, uh, recovered, documented. So for whichever variables we are getting real world feedback, real world observation, we, we want to uh, minimize the real world error and the error, and we want to minimize the difference between the real world number and the number predicted by our model. So that's this term at the right, loss function L, between these uh, variables of whatever we can measure from, whatever time series measurements we can get from real world. Uh, so that's Y and Y hat is the predicted from one from our model. So we try, want to minimize the difference between these. Uh, so this is the main part of this equation, but it's actually a little more complex which I won't uh, explain, but just uh, like, I'll just very briefly say that we won't have observation for every point. Time series are noisy and missing sometimes. So we ignore those time steps where we are missing. That's one part. Second part is we want to give more importance to recent time series and less important to la la last time, uh, 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 older time series. So for example, if we have data from March, let's say, let's say February 1st to 2020 to Feb, like today, let's say 18th March, 2021, we want to give more recent data, uh, more importance. And then this time step term is about using training data for a given time interval, and then trying to predict or forecast for uh, some other time intervals. So for example, if we want to train on one year of data and predict on uh, 30 days of data, that's what this term does. Uh, so that's the main loss function. On top of it, we try to have some regularization. So this first regularization is trying to smooth the prediction between a given time step, y t, y hat t, with the next step, y hat t plus one, with the previous step y hat t minus one so that the predictions that we are moving they don't vary widely day to day they are relatively smooth another term we have is uh enforcing uh for all of these compartments uh like those uh, seir states are also called compartments so for each of those compartments the parameters which uh with the co the rate coefficients which um, talk, which uh, measured the number of cases leaving the leaving the compartment, uh, leaving the state, they should not be more than one. So we enforce that with this, like for example, for documented infected, we have recovered plus killed, which is deaths, plus hospitalized. Those are the three ways to go out of infected documented. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, we, they should not be greater than one. So we enforce that construct here. 
And similarly, we enforce that constraint for all others, which are here, which I won't again explain more detail. Uh, second last one is we enforce a constraint on the re effective reproduction number. So this one we have, this is a hyperparameter in machine learning terms and it's set through both, uh, it's set through hyperparameter exploration. Um, and then finally we get our full loss term where we combine all these four loss factors that I mentioned with some, uh, with some weighting factor lambda and then we add them all up to get our final loss function. So this is the loss function that we optimize uh, for our model. Uh, so I, I know like I'm going very fast here, but uh, yeah, I wanted to cover the most important parts. So yeah. Uh, now yeah, coming to the implementation of the model. So this is just some, uh, like this is the way I implemented it. Maybe like anyone can implement in a different way, but this is just for some reference. So I used uh, AW, the Amazon Web Services, uh, SageMaker platform, and used a Python notebook for implementing the algorithm. I used TensorFlow framework for implementing and running the model in Python, and used GPU uh, virtual machines for executing the training faster. Uh, the total cost for the experimentation and training was around twenty two fifty dollars. Um, so the details of this technique, results, and the data sets they are available in this uh, in this uh, paper here, white paper here. If you search for Google COVID nineteen forecast, this this will show up. Uh, okay, just the very last slide. So here's some uh, predictions that we did. Uh, so this, these are these predictions are for U.S. states like California, Wisconsin, Vermont, and so on. The green uh, green time series shows the ground truth. As we can see, it's very uh, it changes a lot. There's a lot of variation, and that's because ground truths are not very smooth. They uh, happen in basically some days you get a lot of cases tested, some days you don't. Some days you get a lot of results back from labs, some days you don't. So they uh, are very zigzag because of, and our prediction is in blue line. So we can see that the trend that we follow is similar to what the ground truth green line is doing, but, the, but our lines are much smoother. And the reason is because of all the regularization uh, that we did. And this also is, the blue line is also something which makes more sense to, like it, it's more easier to understand and mis makes more sense to anyone who's interpreting the results. Uh, our results, the mean absolute error for number of deaths uh, over a prediction horizon of uh, 15 days and 30 days, average each day, mis uh, error that we had was mean absolute error was around, uh, around like less than hundreds, like it was as low as tens or twenties in some cases, but in almost all cases, it was less than hundred uh, for every day. Um, so that's the presentation I had. Uh, and is there, I, so I'm using this WebEx for the first time. I haven't used this before. Uh, so yeah, that's the presentation. Let me, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mudit, for a nice presentation. And uh, we are fortunate to catch you at the end of this session. And uh, we had very excellent speakers in this session. And four of uh, excellent speakers have presented this problem in four specific dimensions. And now, may I request the audience to put up some questions? There are certain questions on chat board. And I think that was to Rajiv, and he has already responded. But now the session is open for a uh, question from the panelists so that we can have more clarity on the presentations that we have. So now I invite uh, questions on the first speaker, uh, Dr. Arni Srinivas. If you have any query from Arni Srinivas, please come to the chat board. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, Professor Pandey, some of the people have entered as panelists, so they can ask directly also question. Okay, no, and no some problem. of the members yeah. are still attendees, so they can write in chat box. Sure, sure, sure. So now the panelists can put up their question, please. No, no questions. Can we move to next speaker, please? Uh, Professor Saidun Nisha. Now, is there is there any query or clarification on presentation by uh, Professor Gautam Menon? It was quite interesting that the way he has presented about the networks. So networks, uh, how he got the estimates for those networks was not very clear to me, although the pictures were looking very interesting and uh, to examine and interesting. Apart yeah, yes. from that vaccination, when vaccination is started, what network uh, strategies they are following? That was also not very clear to me. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. And we have to make approximations there. So we know roughly what is the distribution of family sizes at different regions. It, it peaks around four, it dips around two, and you can have even fairly large family sizes in that. So we know that distribution. We construct households with that distribution. We have some idea, however, vague of distribution of workplace sizes. So we just imagine people moving between households and workplaces and coming back. And a certain hospital that caters to somewhere between a thousand to five thousand people in that particular area. All of these is guesswork, because there is very little information available about these networks in reality. So we do that, and then the idea will be that within this community you can now stratify. You can construct households that have a certain distribution of so many people, sixty to seventy age group, so many people, forty to fifty, with the information that we have currently, and then use that, and then design prioritizations of vaccine schedule based on that, which is what we plan to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any any other question, please? Uh, yes, Professor Pandey. I, I, I was just uh, thinking to uh, appreciate Professor Menon's work in many ways because I think, uh, but one of the thing which uh, he admits that the the projections, the thing which you do are very short term and uh, they perhaps do not keep very constant match with the reality. Now, if that admission you are making, I was just wondering that even if you talked about relating the same exercise that you are doing to vaccination and testing strategy, uh, can there be an attempt somewhere just not to just to make things sound more reliable? Uh, can we make some kind of a relationship because the factors that you brought in in terms of projecting and assessing the situation in terms of cumulative response rates. I was thinking that perhaps uh, as your graphs depicted and the, the, the results depicted, I felt that somewhere along the line, the cumulative response rates could have been different than what was in the initial stages and now. Professor Manon, please. Yeah, very good. So uh, the parameters that we use, are the optimization that we do, do allow for time dependence and variation. For example, we do know that we are treating COVID-19 better now than we were at the beginning of the pandemic. With, through very simple, through pronation, through the use of uh, of, of medication towards the end stage of, of um, steroid. So pronation, steroid use, lack of ventilation, no, not using invasive ventilation in the beginning, but only as a last resource. So already we know that the infection, the ISRs are actually coming downward. We put all of that into the model. We allow as many, as much like, ability to introduce time-dependent variation as possible. We also compute a bunch of cumulative quantities. I didn't show them in this particular thing. Of course, cumulative figures are much smoother than this attempt to fit much more jagged data as, as was pointed out in the previous talk. So. I think the important point is that it's always a risk to predict too far in advance with these. The main difficulty being that social behavior is impossible to predict. 
you how people are interacting are they going out more to shops more weddings etc from time to time across the two week period that's the hardest thing the disease part of it you know much more about but the how that how social interaction change the ability of people to pass disease from one to the other that's the harder thing so i would only trust short term predictions i would not trust anything beyond even a month i think that would be very much outside and that is i think something we appreciate now that we didn't adequately appreciate earlier thank you for the question it's a very nice question thank you thank you thank you neeluma is with us if you have any question dr neeluma you can ask thank you so much i was trying to enter it in the qa but sometimes the technology doesn't help us that much uh, i'd really uh, congratulate all the speakers for very wonderful presentation uh, for a medical doctor like me this is a very very interesting presentation i had one question uh, we've done some studies with hydroxychloroquine uh, prophylactic use and uh, we find that uh, there is a lot of variation in the response to hydroxychloroquine uh, and uh, we also find a variety of uh, 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 various parameters which may be uh, affecting it like the age the uh, comorbidities and so on so not only are these indicators for getting the infection they also seem to affect the response to hydroxychloroquine so i just wondered if uh, there have been any studies on simulations uh, for effect of drugs and on and or effect of vaccines and whether anybody would be interested in looking at our data and if that can be useful for uh, uh, simulations in this regard thank you thank you maybe i can i can say a few words about that yes if that's okay that, so we have been looking at models for vaccine efficacy that are after the first dose after the second dose how things ramp up and relate that to the sort of data that is coming out for example from bharat biotech where you know which are the state, which are the, the hospitals in what regions what the serum problems were in those particular regions your data is very much more patient focused individual patient focused it's not sort of the epidemiological data that we normally work with so we can try and do that but i i i think you would need a different set of models from the standard epidemiological models that we use you would need much more sort of very patient specific probably correlative statistical models to try and make a difference to that that would be my input to that question thank you thank you thank you any other question from panelists please So I'm going to now we move on to Rajiv Acharya. Is there any question for uh, Dr. Rajiv Acharya, please, from the panelist or audience? May I ask a question of Dr. Acharya? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, so if you look at what seems to be important for COVID-19 mortality. it much of i mean the sort of pre existing condition seems to be relatively less important than just age and to a lowest approximation you can just look at the ifr as a function of age and that is sufficient to so suggest that for the demographic component of the vulnerability that you're using if you want to discuss covid-19 that should have a larger um, importance than the other features i wondered if you had thought about that or whether this is something that you could you could consider yeah i mean we we are open to suggestions to improve the model and yeah i i agree that we could use that and uh, you know the problem is we need i mean we had to get some data at the district level and the state level maybe state level is some of these data are available but the district level getting district level data on those is little difficult and uh, and that's the reason many of the things like testing i wanted to actually include testing because more testing you you know your risk is less but then uh, that kind of data is not available even if the data is available and not being given to the researchers so we need more data yeah um, uh, i think i had one uh, question from the very beginning about the management of the covid and its uh, spread and i think you have uh, 
uh, guided the policy of the country for various regions of work and the population council and other agencies here in India. Uh, I was wondering that people know that one of the most important factors which was responsible for the spread of this particular uh, virus was the international migration. As we know that what is what has been documented and now people say that the infection initiated from China went to Europe and then from Europe it spread all over the country. To my mind, the simplest intervention would have been that instead of deciding for a lockdown for the entire country, if these travelers coming from the other country would have been quarantined for a definite period around the airport, and after the proper investigation and after the proper consequences, they would have been allowed to enter the country, there was no need of lockdown in any country. So whether do you agree that we committed some mistake at that very point, instead of following this particular strategy, we allowed people into the mix, mixing into the population and then uh, started uh, proposing for lockdown in various localities. So that is one. And the second one, if you look at the Indian scenario, the urban areas are more vulnerable than the rural areas. Why we did not decide that there should not be uniform lockdown policy for urban and rural India. It, it, should, it should have been the different uh, level of lockdown in urban areas and different level of lockdown in rural areas until there was a labor migration from urban to rural areas, which we realized a little later. So can you comment on these two situations? Yes, sir, I was not part of the task force, so I would not be able to say why or uh, how they decided on all these aspects. But, uh, well, I don't in think general, I, I'm, Yeah. I'm, I'm, in I'm general, I'm posing this question with this panel. Right, sir. I understand that. What I'm trying to say that I don't agree with the first one completely because, uh, you know, it's not only the traveler, but the traveler is being in coming in contact with the airline people and many other. So only, uh, you know, we have to probably could have stopped uh, the flights from outside much earlier. That would have been easier for us. Uh, but once it is here, no, even I, in one or two cases or five cases, it is going to spread. Okay. So yeah. why, I mean, what I did think that, yes, there should have been different strategies for our rural districts and urban districts. Uh, in terms of lockdown intensities, uh, uh, intensity and all those. But I think it naturally happened. If you would have gone during lockdown to the rural areas, there was no sign of lockdown, although they could not use health system or they could not go anywhere outside their areas because of lockdown. But within their area, like we in the urban area were almost like homebound. We did not step out of the house. There was nothing like that in rural areas. The agriculture was uh, exempted from lockdown. The agriculture uh, fun thing was anyway uh, going I, on. I think it, it was it was at the later stage, not in the initial. Uh, I think about 15 days, the first 21 days lockdown. After that, the agriculture was opened up. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so I agree that we could have have different district-wise lockdown, uh, you know, strategy. The micro level planning could have been done. Okay, thank so overall, you. Overall, sir, I don't think lockdown was a bad strategy because it actually uh, gave government some time to uh, ramp up the facilities. You can see in Delhi, the 10,000 bed facility came up overnight in 15 days. That would not have been possible if uh, they were busy with other things and not having that time to do all those things. So uh, there is a debate on that. But we can debate a lot on that, definitely. But there is some good and some bad about the lockdowns. Yeah, yeah if I may, uh, can I give a perspective on that? Yes. I... Yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, as I agree with the previous speaker that uh, I don't think just monitoring the international traffic would have been the solution because countries like uh, US, countries like India, they also share a land border where a lot of people uh, migrate both in documented and undocumented ways. Uh, so it's a similar problem in US and in India. 
for countries which are more island uh, like which only primarily have either uh, flight place travel or ship travel such as uh, australia new zealand there it's more practical but i don't think for like even if we had monitored all the international traffic it would have eventually started from like some land border nepal or west bengal or uh, some place and then it would have definitely spread so i think lockdown in one way or the other would have been there. yeah i want to add there for my the point Hello. Yes, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I wanted that the point what uh, Dr. Professor Pandey raised. I want to continue on that. That's the reason, you know, the because of the internal migration, not only international migration, the first model what we built uh, for exclusively for India, in that model that published in the journal I showed, we considered the migration and also the urbanization, uh, not only for India, for various countries, how the fraction of urbanization in that country affected the spread in that particular country. So the, that's that's where the first mathematical, the under-reporting, under-reporting study, which I mentioned. I mean, I, I did not, because this talk today, I gave the talk only exclusively on the AI model, so I did not touch it. If you, the chairman has time, I can uh, show the slide on that. Otherwise, you know, you can, that can, uh, that, um, the article can be read. So, but in, you are right. I mean, in general, Dr. Pandey is right. The understanding the international internal migration also important, other than the international migration. But the lockdowns, I think, the during lockdowns, as uh, uh, Dr. Acharya mentioned, that you know, during lockdowns, that uh, that time to you know time to plan properly that has helped to during the lockdowns. Rajiv. Yes. Yes. I think I think I have uh, some discomfort with the exercise that you did, although it is pretty rewarding in terms of uh, developing a kind of a vulnerability index and uh, and 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 say differential vulnerability. And you also widened the concept of vulnerability. That's one of the good thing that you did in this exercise. But uh, systematically, when you do a kind of a multi-dimensional, multi-domain indexing. It's always better to actually examine or show some kind of intercorrespondence or interdependence between them. Because mm -hmm. you were giving example of two situations. Mm -hmm. uh, Cori code and this, this is the thing which is coming out and the prioritization should be or the emphasis should be like this. For example sake, that was fine. But what I say is in, in relative sense, the vulnerability after you did one thing that would have perhaps excelled more if you would have gone into attempting robustness of this vulnerability, some checking of the robustness, okay? Whether this vulnerability corresponded with the outcomes in terms of robustness test. And that could be done perhaps by doing, you know, the accumulated data that you have till now, or you are telling you did a static exercise. Even if I believe that static exercise, it is better to do that for making it sellable further. That's what I felt. Yeah. One point. Yeah. Second point is that if you do a kind of an interdependence or exercise of the, of the domain specific vulnerabilities, then they will convey actually that which which domain is your primary domain because if you bring so many domains a curiosity obviously arises that i must know which is the i mean i while i like that all domains should be there which is the primary domain i should focus on okay and that is these are the two things that came to my mind because i felt that this kind of exercise data limitation might be a problem but still they are rewarding if we do within those limitations because I think it conveys a lot and it conveys a lot of in terms of setting priorities of intervention at least. Yeah, so uh, if I mean, problem, the problem with understanding this, which I, I have a challenge that I am probably not able to make people understand is that I, as I said in the beginning, this may not correspond with the actual number of cases or cumulative number of cases each region or district have or even death has, okay. But what it may, as we, as I'm saying that it, it has a implication for the, it is a con consequence of the infection. 
that is important. Okay, one consequence is death, but at that point of time, and even now, we have not enough dead data at each district level to be able to estimate that. But then there are other things if we have data on that. For example, economic distress. Okay, mm -hmm. this will make those areas where I showed were very highly vulnerable, but have less number of cases still now. Some of the districts of Bihar or UP and some, but then there are probably economic distress because of the pandemic that we are not able to measure. If we have able to measure those, some of those indicators would have corresponded with that uh, vulnerability even better. Okay, so I would say that uh, let's not only look at the disease outcomes when we uh, we correspond or kind of look at the robustness of this robustness check. I could have done with other data uh, that yes. are other consequences of the epidemic. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Finally, Professor Pandey. Professor Pandey. Pandeji? You can ask uh, Mishra. I... Yeah, yeah, I'm trying, but I think. No problem, but uh, if anybody had any question for Mudit. Oh, uh... uh, yeah. Any, 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 uh, any question for Mudit? From the panelists, please. I had a question, not a question. I was just curious about the last covariate that Mudith had of those. Uh, Mudith, can you just remind me that last covariate? I was writing down somewhere. The last covariate the, after uh, the mobility. Right. Yeah, yeah. The last one is about Google search trend data. So when people yes, search on yes, Google. Yeah. Yes. So so you assume that people who are sick or who feel sick, they may be searching for the symptoms and trying to know the symptoms or all these things, right? That is the assumption behind the COVID. -19. What did you find? Is the COVID really was robust or was really working for your model well? Uh, yeah, actually, this know was, the mobility uh, one people are using. Some people have done the mobility model, trying to you know look at those and the very interesting mobility data during the lockdown period, the weekends and the non weekends and when they were opening up. But I didn't know about this COVID that you have taken. Yeah. Yeah, so actually, uh, so first of all, yeah, it was quite important. One of the, like the mobility one is the most important one. This is the second most important one. Mm. And this is not the only place where this search trend data has been applied. Uh, Google has actually done research in previous years on flu, spread of flu within US. So they can show that as it spreads in different locations, people start searching about it. So it's not, of course, accurate at individual level. One person may or may not do it, but at a population level, it's a very big signal. Okay. Aggregate level. But Aggregate are, these level. Data, are these data available publicly? Such uh, yes, yes. The, both everything that I mentioned is available publicly. They, what they what Google does is it tries to anonymize and aggregate it. So in places where there is very less data, it will not even publish it. And in some other places, it will add some noise so that it's not like you cannot uh, reverse engineer it. But right. like it's a, at such a big scale that uh, it's very still very useful. Yeah, thank you so much. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I want to add that about that question on the mobility part. Uh, I have considered the in the within the US, uh, the, this is for you know both Rajiv and uh, Modit. Uh, the within the US, uh, the tribal population suddenly the Navajo Nation, you know the the tribals in the US, uh, the spread among them was very very higher. Where tribals means you know the original, uh, the original Americans, you know the they call here Indians, the the Indian the original Indian Americans. Uh, they were, you know, they were before Columbus came to America, the, the Britishers and the French, you know, that history of how they colonized America, that history. 
all of us know. So before the colonization happened, the people, those who are living, they, they were known as Indians. And they were given an area called Noaha Nation. That's within the US. So there, is a, there is a locality given for them to live. And among them, the vulnerability of COVID is very, very high. So CDC introduced uh, uh, me with the model, I mean, the, uh, to work with the local uh, administrators with them. And uh, I, you know, earlier IAPS are some of the, this thing Gautam knows that you know, the chicken walk model, I developed a chicken walk model, that is how the birds the spread among the birds, uh, the network model, uh, which can understand the, the disease among the birds, as uh, Dr. Pandey was mentioning in the beginning. So that kind of things they wanted me to develop for the mobility within the Noaho Nation tribals using the mobile phone network towers, using the tower data, how the tower data can supply them the weekends, non weekends. And that actually helped uh, them to understand how frequently they go out, what is the frequency of traveling to the shops, what is the frequency of traveling to the various other things, and then how to control from the, the mobility data. And uh, I came to know from some other studies within India also that you know some groups in india also seriously looking at the travelers within the you know the various uh, kind of using the mobile phone network data in that way the uh, the thing and the coming to the robustness that that part is done the the modeling part coming to the robustness question what you are raising that's very important uh, this is modit uh, this thing the linearization any ai you know my the the fundamental point that i'm making through the various ai conferences wherever i'm going is that you know the the ai is highly accurate only when there is a noise is controlled in the data. If the noise is not properly controlled in the data, AI models cannot be, I mean, AI model can one can apply. You know, one can apply AI model anywhere, you know, wherever we want, we can apply, that's not a problem. But then the noise, denoisation is properly done and the mapping, because AI is close to the math, not to the computer science, because the mapping properly, the domain in the data can be properly one-to-one -one mapped with the, the function. So once the mapping is done properly, AI can predict better things, better ways. Similarly, the mobile mobility data, whatever data we use, you know, for example, our model also, the data, whatever we obtained, the denoising is done before we apply to the, then the robustness question would not arise. Did not arise. We are ro robustness comes when there is an error in the data. When there is an accurate mapping is done properly, it's all becomes a deterministic. There is no statistical error involved in the data. That's my point on that. Dr. Mishra, uh, you have any you. question to the people or uh, we can close it. Uh, I think Dr. Pandey is also not around. We have crossed uh, more than oh, yeah, two yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah, we are almost <laughs> It to was supposed to be 90 minutes this thing session, but yes, we have yes. taken one uh, around 150 minutes. Okay, yeah. if, there are, if there are no more questions and queries, I would suggest that uh, I must uh, uh, thank all the uh, presenters for beautiful and very, very extensive presentation, impressive presentation. And uh, I, I, I learned a lot uh, uh, in this uh, two hours. Uh, and I think this exercise was pretty good, uh, quite rewarding for the people who participated. So I thank all the panelists and, uh, and the participants of this session. And I thank IIPS to have given the opportunity for me to conduct it and I hope this becomes a successful endeavor to give something uh, consolidated. Thank you. I also thank like you. to thank, thank all the plenary speakers. Some of them got very short time. For example, Mudit got information only on Sunday, but he agreed it <laughs> and same, same, same thing with Rajiv because I have two speakers dropped out and I wanted to make this session interesting with at least four speakers. And uh, I am happy that we can do it. We have extended this uh, session to more than 90 minutes. It is now around 150 minutes. So it shows the interest of the people as well as the researchers who are working in this field. And they have come up and given their own research and presentations were very nice. And it was very uh, in-depth and people can follow it. And apart from that, I also like to thank uh, the, uh, Professor Mishra, and for him also, I have given very short time, but he agreed. 
on the other hand uh, professor pande he has taken today second dose of vaccine and in the uh, when i have given him the date 18 he said i will try to save but i think he had gone from this uh, because we were keeping him more than two hours he said i may or may not be able to sit for so long i said it will be only for 90 minutes you can tolerate it so he has tolerated that i think more than two hours now he had gone so i like to thank him also in his absence that he has taken pain to attend this also because with second dose people have said that there are some symptoms people are required to take rest but he was able to chair this session and uh, participate as well as uh, motivated the people. And apart from that, I also like to thank all the people who have attended this session and uh, people from US, other countries, Canada, and other countries also were there in this session. For example, uh, Ramana was there, uh, uh, Dr. Udhari, not Udhari Shakar, Vinod Mishra was there, uh, Dr. Shirin uh, Bai was there. So all uh, senior demographer, public health persons were around in this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mishra. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. Mudit, Thank you. Rajiv, uh, 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 Arni, uh, Dr. Gautam. Dr. Gautam also got very short time to do this thing, but he's expert in this field, so for him, there is no problem. Thank you, Dr. Gautam. Thank you, Thank everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much Thanks. for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Hey, Dr. Pandey is back. Dr. Pandey, you want to say some one word <laughs> before closing the session? Yeah. Uh, he has closed. He has closed it. Okay. Please let us close. Yeah. 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 Sir, my voice has not been heard. Sorry. Uh, sir, same Pandey, sir. Aapka... Professor Pandey, we have closed because we were not able to see you. So we thought already we have crossed two hours, more than two hours, and I'm making you sit here after second dose of this thing vaccine for so long. <laughs> In the voice, you know, we are not able to hear his voice. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, is, he is muted. I think Dr. Pandey, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Professor Pandey, unmute yourself. Professor unmute Pandey. Uh, Madam, there is some problem with his uh, voice, so it has not been heard. Okay, okay. Means that's a uh, what you call audio problem. Video is uh, been. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, otherwise, you write in chat box. Thank you, Professor Pandey. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Okay. Okay, say night. Good night, good night, good night. Good night, sir. Manoj Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, see you. Yes, sir. See you, sir. The person has gone out because he has to go to Uran. It is about he will reach by 10, 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. So he okay. suggested okay. that he wanted to do. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Manoj, okay, you can thank close the close the meeting. I am closing. I am closing the meeting. Thank you. Okay, close the okay. meeting.